Well, I can now officially say good afternoon. Um, welcome back. Um, as you can see, I've done a same as Jerry and uh, headed down to Southern California for a bit of sunshine. It's uh, very nice here in uh, the dude studio. So uh, maybe I'll find his whiskey sometime soon. But anyway, um, I'm sure the dude doesn't mind me. Well, I know he doesn't mind me uh, using his studio. It was him that sent me the various pictures of it. Um, including, as you can see, in the background there, the captain himself. Okay. Um, first article that I want to put up is... Um, this one here. So as I say, this is a, this is a continuation. Hi, hi Kelly. Um, this is a continuation of the series of um, correspondence, if you like, with the uh, various appeal courts, um, etc. Looking back to uh, beginning of last year, around about the uh, January, February, well, following on from the December of uh, 2018 so looking at the january and february of 2019 when some important um things were uh, put forward um and obviously uh, presented by uh, kathleen zellner and i just feel that a uh, high hi alice as well i just feel that it's it's quite significant how the ship is slowly turning in um in favor of uh, truth and justice so first of all um here by, by the way the obviously the thumbnail is hi mill billy the thumbnail is of port judge paul riley and uh here we have a article from john farak which mentions the various members of the appeals court as it was in 2013 i believe hopefully you can all see this let's uh, just make sure as usual everything's working as it should do and i believe it is yep um also at the top there it says about the documentary um being pushed back and i've put the link in the description for you to to read it so it'll be easier enough to find so um let's have a look at this then um so this was john farak in august of 2016 obviously to do with brendan a federal magistrates william duffin that is 91 page ruling overturning Brendan Das's murder conviction raises questions about the Wisconsin Appeals Court Appeal Court's handling of the case, and so it should. In January of 2013, obviously before making a murder came out, Wisconsin's Court of Appeals District 2, which is where Kathleen Zellner is at the moment with the case, upheld Brendan's March 2006 confession to uh, Bert and Ernie. Um, we get the fast bender in connection with the November 2005 death of Teresa. Brendan was 16 at the time. The confession was instrumental in a jury's decision in 2007 to find Brendan by then 17 guilty of first degree intentional homicide, second degree sexual assault and mutilation of a corpse. Manitroc County Circuit Judge Jerome Fox, who presided over Dassey's trial, sentenced Dassey to life in prison. Um, now, obviously, we know that in 2010, yeah, Brendan, uh, with the help, either, either nine or ten, um, but anyway, before 2013, obviously, um, Steve and Laura got on board Brendan's case and uh, appealed to uh, Judge Fox, and it went back to the uh, Manitowoc Court, 
the circuit court, and then obviously was appealed up to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals District 2. And of course we hear, don't we, even in Making a Murder One, Laura talking about the, the fact that everybody has a habeas right to habeas corpus. So anyway, in 2013, Brendan's conviction was held, was upheld by the Wisconsin Court of Appeals District 2, which consisted of one, Lisa S. Neubauer, Neubauer, who is obviously still there, but um, she tried to get to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, uh, but was beaten in the election by Brian Hagedorn. Um, so Lisa Neubauer, a lawyer with Foley and Lardner from 1989 until 2007, when she joined the appeals court. Paul F. Riley, the one that's looking at the case now, who had been the city attorney in New Berlin from 1997 until 2002. He was a circuit court judge in Waukesha County from 03 to 10 before joining the Court of Appeals. Chief Judge Richard Brown, who retired last summer after 37 years on the appeals court bench. The Court of Appeals District 2 consists of Calumet, Fond du Lac, Green Lake, Kenosha, Manitowoc, Ozaki, Racine, Sheboygan, Walworth, Washington, Waukesha, and Winnebago counties. Here are some key distinctions in the Wisconsin Appeals Court's ruling and last Friday's decision by U.S. Dus District Court Magistrate Judge William Duffin that overturned Das's conviction on the question of ineffective legal assistance by Das's first lawyer, public defendant Len Kaczynski. The Court of Appeals in January 13, 2013 said that Dassey contends that Kaczynski rendered ineffective assistance due to an actual conflict of interest that so breached the fundamental duty of loyalty owed him that under Coyler versus Sullivan and its progeny. Prejudice can be presumed. We disagree. Dassey draws no viable link between Kaczynski's actions and any demonstrable detriment to him. Kaczynski was long gone before Dassey's trials trial or sentencing. Dassey has not convinced us that Kaczynski's actions amounted to an actual conflict and that Kaczynski's advocacy was adversely affected, such as it was detrimental to Dassey's interests. So clearly at the moment they're just rubber stamping. Back in 2013, they do not want to rock the boat. Well, as we know, the boat has been well and truly rocked and is heading in a completely different direction. But we will just carry on with the next bit, of course, because this is important. Whereas Duffin, on August 12, 2016, although it probably does not need to be stated, it will be. Kaczynski's conduct was inexcusable, both tactically and ethically. It is one thing for an attorney to point out to a client how deep a hole the client is in, but to assist the prosecution in digging that hole deeper is an affront to the principles of justice that underlie a defence attorney's vital role in the adversarial system. That said, Das's attempt to characterise Kaczynski's misconduct as a conflict of interest under Sullivan is misplaced. And, I, and I'm sure that we've discussed this with Tracy before, but she'll probably need to explain it to me again um, when I have a chat with Tracy Keogh over the weekend. Uh, we're scheduled for, I think, one o'clock my time, which would be 10 o'clock Tracy's time. But I'm actually, um, Tracy Keogh, I'm actually finishing a bit sooner. So if, um, if we can get it started a bit sooner, then we will do. Um, Secondly, although Kaczynski's misconduct is indefensible, the United States Supreme Court has never accepted arguments such as those Dassey makes here as a basis for relief under Coyler versus Sutherland, Sutherland, Sutherland. Sullivan. Therefore, federal law prohibits the court from granting Dassey habeas release on the first claim he presented 
to this court. Okay, I think that's that's enough of that. Um, I say I I don't take too much of well yeah I do take issue with the fact that they're just rubber stamping what Fox um, had already said. Um, but are we are we that surprised? Um, maybe not. Although um, you would like to think that you know surely Riley Neubauer and the other fella. You know, they saw what uh, Duffin saw. Anyway, as I say, it does, the, the tide is definitely turning. Let's have a look now at, oh, I need to do this first. Add that. So here, now I'm not going to read through the state's response because it is utter garbage and we all know it's garbage and we can see that it's garbage by the response by both we've got here um steve's reply through um kathleen zellner to the state's response to the motion for the uh, for the remanding the case back to the circuit court because of the bones issues and we've also got the decision so let's have a look at the uh, this was february the 1st 2019 state of wisconsin court of appeals district 2 so this is kathleen zellner writing once again basically to paul riley state of wisconsin versus stephen a avery defendant appellants reply to the state's response in opposition to steve's motion to stay the appeal and remand the cause to the circuit court Now comes defendant appellant Stephen A. Avery through his attorneys, Kathleen T. Zellner and Stephen G. Richards, and for his reply to the state's response in opposition to his motion to stay the appeal and remand the course to the circuit court states. States as follows. Introduction. And I don't think that Kathleen Zellner is really mincing her words very much here. The state's response conveys an attitude of impunity for its past actions of withholding exculpatory evidence and its current action of continuing the concealment of the destruction of potentially exculpatory or useful evidence. When the state disclosed a CD of violent porn from the Dasi Yanda computer 12 years after the CD was created and concealed from prior counsel. The state argued, as it does now, that Mr. Avery was attempting to add new material to his 97406 motion. This court did not accept that disingenuous response then, and it should not now accept the state's current disingenuous response, which echoes the same argument. The state wants this court to overlook the undisputed fact that two weeks ago, on December 28th, 2018, when it filed its response to Mr. Avery's request for new DNA testing of the bones from the Manitowoc gravel pit, it never once admitted or disclosed that it had given the bones back to the Holbach family in 28, 20, 2011 without notice to Mr. Avery or his counsel. I'm not sure about the two weeks ago on December 28th. It's maybe, maybe, yeah, that's, I'm not sure about that. But yeah, when it filed its response to Mr. Avery's request for new DNA testing of the bones from the Manitrop gravel pit, it never once admitted or disclosed that it had given the bones back to the Holbachs. Plaintiff respondent's response in opposition to the petition to stay the appeal and remand this case to the circuit court, December 28th, 2011, pages one to eight. Instead, the state carried on its charade of concealment by claiming that Mr. Avery could voluntarily dismiss his appeal the state's response specifically stated, and I'm sorry that we have to read through this garbage, the state notes that 
Steve has the option to voluntarily dismiss this appeal if he wishes to litigate a statute 97407 motion now. If he chooses to do so, and if the circuit court grants DNA testing that produces exculpatory results, it is possible that some or all of the issues raised in Steve's 97406 filings will become mute. Alternatively, if Avery is not confident that his 97407 motion will be successful or not confident that testing will produce exculpatory results, he should wait and see if he prevails on appeal and then decide if it is necessary to litigate a Wisconsin statute 97407 motion. A movement can bring a 97407 motion at any time after conviction or adjudication. So what does all that garbage mean? Well, as Kathleen Zellner points out, what the state fails to mention in its helpful guidance, you know, um, <laughs> some great sarcasm there, <laughs> that what the state fails to mention in its helpful guidance to Mr. Avery is that it facilitated the destruction in 2011 of the very evidence that Mr. Avery would be hoping to test if he was so foolish as to voluntarily dismiss his current appeal. The state has not been prejudiced in any way by the delays granted to Mr. Avery as a result of the state's misconduct in withholding and facilitating the destruction of material evidence. The state wants this court to turn a blind eye to those actions and focus instead on Mr. Avery's actions in seeking a second delay in filing his brief. Given that this case spans 12 years post-trial, the request of an inmate serving a life sentence without parole in seeking two delays based on recently discovered, suppressed and destroyed evidence hardly constitutes a threat to the orderly administration of justice in the state of Wisconsin. If Steve waited to raise this current claim until after his appeal was concluded, the state would undoubtedly argue that he had failed to show a sufficient reason for not raising the issue sooner. As a result of the state's actions in concealing and withholding the uh, Bobby Dassey CD and concealing the return of the bones to the Holbach family, Steve has been forced to lay his appeal and therefore his quest for a new trial and eventual freedom. One, Steve's motions are not dilatory. The state in its response to Steve's motion to stay the appeal and remand the cause suggests that Mr. Avery's motions to remand for further proceedings are intended to, quote, perpetually delay this appeal. This suggestion is belied by the record, including the instant motion. Mr. Avery has pursued two motions to stay the appeal and remand for further proceedings and one motion to supplement the record on which this court ordered proceedings in the circuit court. Steve maintains that each of these motions raised meritorious claims for relief based upon issues relating to his original 97406 motion and supplements. Indeed, Steve has not filed these motions to delay this court or unduly postpone his appeal. No, instead, Steve has filed his motions to apprise this court of ongoing due process and discovery violations that only after months of litigating Mr. Avery's post-conviction motion and its appeal have recently been discovered. These motions are not intended for delay. This motion for stay and remand is analogous to Steve's previous motion to supplement the record in connection with an alleged due process violation. Steve has previously moved this court 
for a remand to the circuit court to litigate motions to supplement the record with a previously withheld CD containing unique violent porn search material from Bobby's computer. On the 15th of May 2018, Steve's motion to supplement the record on appeal. In that motion, Steve asked this court for leave to supplement his motion with the content of the CD containing the results of the forensic examination of Bobby's computer. Neither the CD nor its contents had ever been produced to Steve or for, of his defence team at any stage of his criminal proceeding, for obvious reasons. Because Dean and Jerry would have been alerted to the to the fact that they would be able to um, um, name Bobby as a Denny suspect. In this is, instance, this court retained jurisdiction but remanded the case to the circuit court for Steve to file a supplemental post-conviction motion. Because Steve's allegations relate to issues already raised in the underlying record, the same outcome is appropriate here. Because this court originally remanded for scientific testing so that test results could be including in Steve's 97406 motion, the state was on notice that Steve intended to test the suspected human pelvic bones recovered from the Manitroc County gravel pit. Steve's 2015 appeal concluded on September the 8th, 2016, when this court remanded the case to the circuit court for post-conviction scientific testing of evidence. And that's because, of course, Steve had already started an appeal in 2015. Um, and then September 8th was when, uh, by the time Kathleen had stepped in. Among the, among the evidence, Steve asked the circuit court to test were the suspected human pelvic bones collected in the Manitroc County gravel pit under Calumet County property number 8675. Therefore, the state has been on notice that Mr. Avery wished to obtain the Manitroc County gravel pit bones for several years. The state fails to acknowledge that Steve is appealing the circuit court's error in abusing its discretion in denying Steve's motion to vacate its October the 3rd, 2017 order, allowing order and allowing additional scientific testing. Moreover, the Manitroc County gravel pit bones were a subject of the September 18, 2017 agreement wherein the parties agreed to further scientific testing, thus, the state's claim that the instant motion is devoid of foundation in the record is specious. Steve has been petitioning the circuit court for, court for testing of the Manicot County gravel pit bones for years. With such a foundation in the record on appeal, the, the, the state's response in opposition to Steve's motion should be laughed at for the pile of garbage that it is. The state should not benefit from concealing a report, failing to give notice and facilitating the destruction of biological evidence. The state's opposition to Steve's motion is tantamount to asking this court to sanction a rule where prosecutor may hide, defendant must seek. Such a rule is not tenable in a system constitutionally bound to accord defendants due process. After all, the state, in its response to Steve's motion, makes no effort to deny the due process violations that Steve alleges, i.e. that the state concealed a police report, failed to give statutorily, statutorily, statutorily mandated notice to Steve and his attorneys, attorneys of its intent to destroy this biological evidence, then facilitated the destruction of the same evidence. The state 
should not now reap the benefit of its past statutory and due process violations. Such an outcome would contravene the sense of basic fairness inherent in our <laughs> justice system. Conclusion. Wherefore, undersigned counsel respectfully request that this court enter an order staying this appeal and remanding the course to the circuit court for proceedings to determine whether the state has violated Youngblood versus Arizona. So, Paul Riley, who, as, you, as we saw back in 2013, just went along with everybody else, is the one that in February 25th, 2019, he writes to huh, the very dishon dishonorable Angela Suck at this, um, Lynn at the uh, Circuit Court, the Assistant Attorney General, of course, Lisa Comfer, who was taken over from uh, Fallon. <laughs> The current district attorney of Manitowoc, who is Jacqueline Labray, obviously Steve Richards, of, uh, who's with uh, Kathleen Zellner, um, Tiffany Winter, who is Lisa Comfer's assistant, so Comfer and Winter are the ones <laughs> right in the garbage at the moment, and Kathleen. You are hereby notified that the court has entered the following order state of wisconsin versus steve before p j riley steve by counsel appeals from this circuit court's denial of his wisconsin statute 97406 post conviction motions he moves this court to stay the appeal and remand to the circuit court so that he may raise new claims premised on the recent discovery of a previously undisclosed police report dated September the 20th, 2011, which according to Steve's appellate counsel, reflects law enforcement's transfer of multiple suspected human bones from the Manitowoc County gravel pit to the White and Funeral home, home for return to Teresa Holbach's family. He's straight in there, isn't he, this time? Steve alleges that the state violated its statutory duty to preserve evidence. See Wisconsin Statute 968205. Yep, we've looked at that. And that the state's actions violated Steve's constitutional due process rights. Youngblood rights. The state has filed a, an objection to Steve's remand motion on the ground that it constitutes a new and separate action which is unrelated to the orders. Steve presently appeals is unnecessary to the resolution of his pending appeal and would result in a necessary delay and litigation. The state's objection points out that this is, in effect, Avery's third remand request. The state's objection does not address the merits of Steve's claimed statutory and constitutional violations and it has not responded to Steve's supplemental filings alleging the destruction, possible destruction of evidentiary items which it appears the parties previously agreed to preserve. The state suggests that the appeal, the appeal is languishing and that if Steve wishes to pursue new claims outside the scope of Statute 97406, post-conviction orders presently on appeal, he could dismiss the pending appeal or wait until its conclusion to file his new claims. As to the former, Avery understandably disagrees, aware that dismissing this appeal will preclude re review of the underlying orders entered to date. Having considered the party's submissions, we determined that the best course of action is to grant Steve's motion to stay the appeal and to remand 
under the Wisconsin statute 808075 for action upon specific issues. As the state's response acknowledges, the decision to remand is left to this court's discretion. Though we are not required to remand, we determine that this procedure strikes an appropriate balance given the specific circumstances of this case. Due to this case's extensive history, there is a benefit to having existing claims developed or litigated while they are relatively fresh, rather than positioning this claims to be procedurally, procedurally barred in a future proceeding. For these reasons, we desire a ruling on the merits so that all claims to date can be considered in a single appeal. The briefing in this appeal has not commenced. There appears to be some potential overlap between the old and new issues. Therefore, um, and I, I, I wonder if Judge Sukovic really wanted this coming back to her. I don't, I don't think she did. Because by having to stick up for the state, remember Roll's great song about assistant DA, it, it's really dragged her into this. And people can see the corruption that she is involved with. It is ordered that this appeal is remanded forthwith to Judge Superwitch to permit Steve to pursue a supplemental post-conviction motion raising claims for relief in connection with the state's violation of 968205 and Youngblood. It is further ordered that any supplemental post-conviction motion shall be filed in the circuit court within 14 days. It is further ordered that the circuit court shall conduct any proceedings necessary to address the claims raised in the supplemental post-conviction motion and shall enter an order containing its findings and conclusions. It is further ordered that if a party intends to order a transcript of any post-remand hearing, the party shall do so within 10 days after the circuit court enters its order deciding the supplemental post-conviction motion. The ordering party shall file a statement on transcript. Any such transcript shall be filed and served within 30 days after its request. The ordering party shall provide the court reporter with a copy of this order. It is further ordered that the circuit court clerk shall retransmit the record to this court within 20 days after the later of the entry of the circuit court order deciding the supplemental post-conviction motion or the filing of any post-remand hearing transcript if ordered. The record shall include any papers filed pursuant to this remand. It is further ordered that the appeal is stayed until the return of the record following remand. It is further ordered that the appellate shall file an appellant's opening brief presenting all grounds for relief within 40 days after the return of the record. Okie dokie. So I think that's enough of that for, uh, for today. Um, we'll have a look and see what... Uh, what happens after that well of course we know what happens after that we are we are <laughs> the case went back to angela who uh, who did her usual no surprise there and so it's back before judge riley anyway i thought it was good to go back over this and, and just just to you know, do a retrospective and a, a refresh of the memory as um Paul Riley says, you know, that these, things, these, these things need to be addressed here and now, uh, not least because they are fresh in the memory, um, but in any case, that they would have been, uh, they could have been barred later on. And of course, we get the, uh, the state claiming procedural bar, procedural bar, procedural bar, and Kathleen retaliates, quite rightly, with exactly the same, but it's called estoppel. Um, Anyway, um, we'll catch you all again soon. As I say, this weekend, Saturday, um, one o'clock my time, potentially earlier. Earlier, if um, if, if available, then uh, you know uh, we'll uh, have a rechat with uh, Tracy because I know she was interested in the uh, fact that it was 
well, particularly the, the one year since uh, ben, Brendan's uh, appeal. Uh, so let's see who we've got here. We've got Bean Green, Alice. And you've got Silkman. Yes, the state had had all the time. Let's pop that up. Yeah. The state had all the time it needs, but for the boys and their families, time is running out. The state simply changes its figureheads and keeps towing the same. And yeah, obviously, you know, it actually has been going on for seven years. If the state is so confident on their guilt and they're not, then yeah, what what are they trying to hide? We all know what they're trying to hide. If they're waiting for Sean Rick to come out with his documentary and that's gonna make make any any great difference, I doubt it. Alice Kelly, hi, Alice. Yep, I think I think we've got you all. Oh, Mel Billy's still here. T one, yeah. <laughs> but the the good thing is you see that it's actually in california they they are eight hours behind so it's coming up for um about 20 to 5 in the in the morning there so they should all be fast asleep they don't realize that i'm here hopefully okay Anyway, I'm going to say cheerio and we'll uh, we'll catch you all soon. Cheers. Bye for now.